Undertakers during the Victorian era had some inventions and innovations in the casket technology as well. They developed safety caskets. One of the caskets they developed at this time was to tie a rope around the deceased's wrist and so that and run a, a string up through a tube to a bell on the surface. That way, if the newly deceased found himself buried six feet under, all he'd have to do is shake his wrist, which would ring the bell, and that would alert the caretaker of the, gar of the graveyard, who was no doubt working the graveyard shift, um, to come and dig him up quickly. Other inventions or innovations for safety cassocks were air tubes and a, a window that they could see the deceased's face to see if decomposition was setting in or whether his countenance was getting better. And all God's people said, ew. We may chuckle at this uh, optimistic outlook of uh, a deceased person suddenly jolting to life, but you know, with all the advancements that we've made at this time, there are still reports of people's death who are greatly exaggerated. In March of 2014, one 79 year old Walter Williams found himself in a body bag about to be embalmed, woke up. It seems the doctors had mistaken his death for his pacemaker shutting off. In Germany, a funeral director got the shock of his life when the woman he was dressing to prepare for the casket all of a sudden sat up as well. After he picked himself up off the floor, he called the paramedics and indeed they did find a slight heartbeat in this lady. But she died for real a few days later. In the Philippines, a three-year-old woke up and sat up in the casket during a wake. It was a mistake by the family because the girl had been suffering a high fever and was merely in a coma. Now you can imagine all the commotion that took place when someone who was supposed to be dead all of a sudden sits up. Not the least of which would be the immediate cancellation of the funeral. This is the season of Pentecost in which we focus on life in the kingdom of God. And the gospel lesson for this, the third son in the Pentecost, tells us a similar story of a funeral being interrupted. It seems that uh, with Jesus uh, and Luke's reporting of it, that this uh, was a strange and odd occurrence, and it is. But when you look through scripture, it seems like in God's kingdom, it's not such a strange deal. In fact, it almost looks like a pattern because we see it happening in ancient Israel in our Old Testament lesson. We see it reaching perfection in the resurrection of Jesus. And then it reminds us as well that in the future, all the dead in Christ will one day sit up. Luke reports about the widow's son and... It's, again, a reminder to us of the shocking reversal that happens in God's kingdom. What seems to be a strange occurrence really isn't that strange after all. A crowd was following Jesus. And as they were approaching the town of Nain, which is in the far northern regions of, uh, of Israel, a funeral procession was coming out of the gate. A widow's son had died. And that's a double tragedy. Not only would the woman be grieving deeply for her son, but the procession going out was also a kind of a foreshadow of her future going out as well. Because she would have no means of support. You see, in those days, women did not work for wages outside the home. Her only option at this time was to beg for alms. The procession of the funeral was quite large because people would drop whatever they were doing to fall in line. The Jews were really fascinated with death as well, with extremely elaborate rituals and strict protocols to follow. The widow would be walking in front of the bier, the stretcher on which they would be carrying the deceased person. And 
To touch that beer would make one unclean for a day. To touch the dead body would make one unclean for a whole week. And so this grieving mother, as the custom was, would walk in front of the beer. No one around her. No one to comfort her. Because she would have been the one who would have cleaned the body and prepared it for burial. She would be ritually unclean. And anyone who would touch her would also be unclean for seven days. So there she was, all alone, leading the procession out of the city gate. But our scripture says that when Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her. His heart goes out to her. And he says to her, don't weep. And shockingly, he walks up and touches the beer, exposing himself to the uncleanness. But in this case, and like many cases in God's kingdom, the reverse happens. The uncleanness didn't get transferred to Jesus. Jesus' cleanness gets transferred to the corpse. Because he says, young man, I say to you, get up. And the young man sat up and began to talk. Certainly there were people probably in the possession who just fainted right there on the spot. Others probably screamed. A couple of them probably grabbed their cell phones to call for the paramedics. But this is the way John, or St. Luke reports it. St. Luke says that fear seized them. And they glorified God saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. Yeah, the raising of the dead son is an unusual event, <laughs> to say the least. But it wasn't an unprecedented event. The people there at Nain would have immediately thought about Elijah raising the widow's son at Zarephath in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 17 there. They would have immediately thought that Jesus is like this Elijah of old. That's why they said, a great prophet has risen among us. As Elijah raised the widow's son and gave him back to his mother, so Jesus raises the, the son of, widow son of Nain and gives him back to his mother. Death has been pushed back. The family restored. New hope was given. The sign of Nain, though, isn't a complete sign. It's what would be called a prophetic sign. A prophetic sign that the kingdom of God was breaking in. That was one of the signs that the people were to look for to determine whether the Messiah had really come. If you would read further on in the verses of chapter 7 there, it tells us about an incident, it tells us that John the Baptist's disciples, when they saw what had happened there, ran back to their master to tell him what had happened. And so John sends his disciples back to ask Jesus, so are you the Messiah? And Jesus' reply was, tell him, show him the evidence, tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and good news is preached to the poor. When the dead start sitting up, something new is happening. God's kingdom is breaking into this world, and the Messiah has arrived. But this sign again of the miracle at Nahum, this prophetic sign is not the complete sign. Those whom Jesus raised were merely resuscitated, given a new shot at life. They would later die again. The complete sign, the real resurrection, the renewed eternal life in God's kingdom was something yet to come. Come. 
The healing that we experience in our life is a subtle reminder to us that ultimate healing is yet to come. Healing's not the natural course in this world. Sickness, death, and decay are the normal course of things in this world. Healing, when we experience it, tells us and reminds us that ultimate healing is yet to come. That ultimate healing would take an even greater miracle. And indeed, Luke wants us to read this story of the raising of the widow of Nain's son, not only in the light of First Kings and the widow of Zarephath's son, but also in light of another story at the end of the gospel about another dead son and a grieving widowed mother. Unfortunately, this funeral procession was not interrupted. This funeral procession led to the body being laid in a tomb covered with spices, stone rolled in front of it. The body left to rot along with the hopes and dreams of the followers. Jesus was not almost dead or mostly dead. He was quite dead. No exaggeration. The Romans made sure of it, plunging a spear into his chest cavity. The Romans were good at death. But then the unexpected happened. The unthinkable happened. An empty tomb, a resurrected body, eternal life. This perfect resurrection, this complete sign, didn't happen at the end of time. It happened in the middle of time. God's kingdom had opened a crack into the time of this world. And God was giving us a glimpse, a trailer, a preview of what life would be like in that fully restored heaven and earth when his kingdom finally comes. He is telling us that death is defeated. Resurrection will be the the norm for God's people. In this sign, from the widow of Zarephath to the widow of Nain to the widow of Nazareth, these stories tell us that death is not something to be feared or to be fascinated with. The power of death has been greatly exaggerated. Its defeat has been assured in Christ's resurrection. Oh sure, we still await the full coming of the kingdom of God. It's still to come. Here in the present, we still constantly deal with death. And we would hope that God and wish that Jesus would interrupt our funeral procession or that he would remove the uncleanness of death, that he would restore life to the body or restore our health. We wish at times that we would hear that bell ringing on the surface of a grave or that breath would return to the body of the little child who had just died. But these things remind us, the resuscitation of the widow of Nain's son reminds us that anything short of the real resurrection is just a temporary fix. The resurrection of Jesus assures us that life, eternal life, is the final, the end, the full coming of God's kingdom to us. And when Jesus comes back in divine power, on that day, all the dead will sit up. And then we get to say with the Apostle Paul, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed that Jesus never preached a funeral sermon? Never preached a funeral sermon. He rarely talked about death except his own death. He was constantly interrupting funerals. The widow of Nain, 
Jairus' daughter, his friend Lazarus. Jesus never preached a funeral sermon because death does not exist where Jesus is. Think about it. One day, all funeral homes will go out of business. One day, all cemeteries will be useless. One day, all funerals will be canceled forever. Because one day, all the dead will sit up. And that's no exaggeration. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of the faith that we share with one another by speaking together the words of the Nicene Creed. Together we confess, 